Thank you. Thank you, everyone. Well, uh, there's one thing I've learned working with my team that I would like to, to, to share and that I will, I will never forget, is that um, we know that uh, writing fast applications makes our users and our customers happy. So who doesn't want to write fast code? Raise your hand. Now, that's <laughs> interesting. So before we start, I have a couple of questions that I need to ask, and uh, then uh, I'll see what uh, the internet tells us. So the first question is, if you go on your favorite web browser and uh, your favorite uh, search engine and you type, is JavaScript fast? How fast is JavaScript? Probably you get something like this that says, and I'm just quoting, under the right circumstances, it is very fast, actually as fast as C. If you search again, uh, another result would be, why is it so fast? It is because as soon as you understand the event loop and now it processes requests, you realize it's so fast. You start to see a pattern like fast is because it's fast. And you keep going on and you get stuff like, how can it be so fast since it's a single thread? And uh, the answer, like in this example, is because it's lightweight. We keep going, and, and then you find this interesting uh, question. How fast is it compared to Java? Well, because most uh, uh, recruiters think that Java and JavaScript are the same thing, which is kind of interesting. So if you look around on, uh, on the internet, you see stuff like JS is awesome and hot and shines when it comes to a huge amount of short connections. And finally, because, well, I could be all day uh, showing uh, uh, Google results, but what does it make faster than Java? Well, and the answer is because the sync ecosystem has more than 50,000 modules written in a synchronous style. It's kind of strange answer to the, 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 the question. But giving all these questions, we need to ask, do we trust the internet? Like the internet is full of stories, and like some uh, Game of Thrones character said a few weeks ago, stories connect people. However, stories are not exact science. And above all, they, they should not drive uh, us as a software engineer. So, my interpretation is, do I trust the internet? No, I don't. And why? Because uh, I am a software engineer, as you can, uh, if you don't know what, uh, who invented, who coined the term, you can go on our exhibition hall, and uh, there's an uh, uh, explanation there who, who did it. And uh, you see that if you look on a dictionary for software engineering, it says, engineer, the, is the application of science and mathematics by which the properties of matter and the sources of energy in nature are made useful to people. So as a software engineer, we should apply science and mathematics to the way out to solve our problems. So going back to the question, is JavaScript fast? We, need, we must be able to reproduce the problem, we must be able to explain the results and reproduce the results. So I think the right answer is, is JavaScript fast? I don't know, from these results, it's, it's not clear. So starting now with the main topic, like when I was planning the talk, I needed a title. So I end up with 10 things I learned making the fastest JavaScript server runtime in the world. So I carefully decided to pick the word server, because Again, going to Wikipedia for a definition, a server is a computer in a network that, uses, that is used to provide services to other computers in the network. So what I'm, gonna, what I'm about to tell you is not about uh, command line applications or, 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 or lambdas. It's, it's about long running uh, uh, processes. So we need to de also define what is fast. So because when I say fast, I don't mean that uh, I'm fast because I put my server on a, a race car and uh, put the car running around. No, it's what, what I mean by fast is that we need to agree on a common set of metrics. And for this, I'm uh, uh, 
using what the site reliability engineering has, uh, uh, has found out. So if you don't know anything about site reli reliability engineering, there's this interesting link with uh, nice books from Google. And Google has one of the biggest teams on, on, on SRE. And SRE has identified five gold, golden signals. So golden signals are critical to the monitoring teams to uh, uh, monitor their systems and identify uh, uh, problems before they become a uh, really uh, big problem. So there are many metrics to monitor, but uh, this team, this team, this SRE team, uh, show that uh, rate, errors, and latency, saturation, and utilization contain virtually all the information you need to know about what's going on and where. So getting these signals is quite challenging and varies a lot of uh, the tools and, and the services you, 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 you have on your disposal. But for now, I'm just considering rate as in uh, requests per second, errors like in errors per second, of course, and latency as in response time, including waiting and queuing. So focusing on rate, errors, and latency means that I will focus on the software. I'm not going to be focusing on the hardware or in the operating system. So a typical server application has a well-set, uh, well-known set of characteristics. We need to know how the application behaves, and only once we understand that, we can uh, talk about it. So what is a server application? So my definition of server application is a, is a long-running process. It should be deployed on a cloud or in bare metal and it should be attached to a fa fast network, otherwise the uh, network becomes your, your bottleneck, and of course should have enough CPU and memory, so uh, your application is not uh, constrained by, by your hardware. So a long-running process has different characteristics from a short-running process, of course. So in a long-running process, the, the startup and warming up is not really rel relevant in the full span life cycle of the server because it's a very tiny moment. Again, this isn't true if you're talking about uh, web applications on your browser because you want to be as fast as possible because that's what drives the happiness of your, of your users. So now we need to define how to measure things, how to benchmark, th benchmark things. So most internet articles will tell you how fast something is. But most of the time, when you read the whole article, you see some graphs, uh, real, really nice graphs, but the information about how the tests were performed and how the results were obtained is omitted. So from an engineering perspective, this is incorrect. We should be able to reproduce the, 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 the test and the results in a lab that gives you more or less or exactly the same results, of course. Uh, on top of that, the experiment should be peer-reviewed because uh, we need to confirm that the results are not biased. So when I write a benchmark, I don't want to, I don't want to, to make it uh, be my friend and enemy of the others. It needs to be fair. And writing benchmarks, of course, is hard, because first, uh, every benchmark you write will never rep represent a real-world use case. It's always like a tiny subset that doesn't really represent your application. So you need to get into conclusions from just looking at a tiny bit of your uh, life cycle. So getting peer, peers to review your code can be really hard to find. And getting peers to test against and are, that are willing to review what you wrote is even harder. So what I'm trying to tell is that benchmarking is hard. And, um, however, there is a very popular benchmark uh, uh, out there that is called the Tech Empower uh, Frameworks Benchmark. Why is this uh, benchmark so interesting uh, to me? Well, to me, it's like a Tech Empower uh, Benchmark is, shows you the true nature of open source. It has more than 500 contributors, so more than 500 different people have contributed uh, tests and reviewed uh, the tests. There are more than 3,000 merged pull requests, so lots of people spend time uh, reviewing or adding uh, uh, new tests to, to the framework. 
and they already have more than 10,000 commits. So it shows that it's kind of a big, uh, uh, big project. It's not something that someone just planned in, in the weekend. Oh, I want to check how my uh, framework uh, works. No, it's something that has been uh, growing steadily for the uh, last couple of years. And it already tests more than 630 different frameworks. And these frameworks are written in different, different languages. So this makes the, my life easier because I don't need to invent my own benchmark. I don't need to explain it. I can just uh, use it to, to, to prove what I want to say. So if you want to have the, the, the link, this is like their GitHub repo. And from the GitHub repo, you can get to the, to the main website, of course. And as I said, there, there are like 630 different frameworks. So if I would try to print on the screen how it looks right now, um, well, it wouldn't fit on this screen. So what I did, I just rotated my screen. I took a screenshot. And don't worry about the, the, the size. It's, it's not really relevant. What I'm trying to say is that th there are lots of uh, 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 frameworks that are already uh, uh, being tested. And the quick question I want to ask the audience is like, uh, can you spot the best result for the JavaScript framework on this graph? So probably you cannot because it's very small. So I have here helper. You'll find that as shocking as it can be, the first entry for JavaScript ranks at number 89, which performs at about 22.7% of the performance of the best result. So if you look at this, I think, well, we all have this idea that JavaScript is fast, and, uh, uh, but results prove, prove, uh, prove things wrong, that it's not as fast as we think it is. So what we need to do is that we need to look under the hood. So before we can do any optimization, we need to understand what's going on. And we shouldn't jump into conclusions and start tweaking the code of the benchmark, because otherwise we are just yak shaving. You're not really looking into the problem. You're just trying to mitigate what, what could be the cause. So instead of this, we need to take a scientific approach. And if you haven't learned anything about uh, profiling and node applications, I would recommend you to look at uh, the very good tutorial on the Node.js website on, on profiling. So just to give you, like, a, in a nutshell, uh, uh, the, 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 the information from, the, from this tutorial, if you look at uh, one of the tests of the, of the, of the benchmark, which is a very simple uh, return an hello world string from an HTTP server, uh, the best result that you, could saw, that you saw on the benchmark was implemented like this. So it uses the cluster module. The cluster module will fork the node process for the number of CPUs that the, the environment has. And then it uses an express server to uh, set the, the content type and send the response. OK, probably the express uh, is not the most uh, performance uh, library out there, but it, this is just for illustration. So once we do this and we uh, do profiling, uh, we get a flame graph. So flame graphs are a really interesting tool when we're talking about performance because they give you like a visual explanation on where your uh, uh, CPU time is spent. Um, the, 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 the width of the, of the bars or the coloring doesn't really matter. The coloring is just to, to, give it like, to make it nice, and it's called frame graphs because usually we paint it from red to yellow, like a flame. But what, what is important to notice is here, as you go from bottom up, uh, you, you, you see where the code is uh, uh, spending most time on, on your CPU. If you observe this, you basically what the flame graph is telling you is that there is a very tiny piece on the top uh, where, where the J JavaScript code is being uh, uh, spent on. And then there's lots of time uh, where it's spent on native. And native means the, the, the node bindings, V8, libuv for the sync IO, and libuv also for the event loop. So once we start uh, trying to optimize this, 
uh, the code, we, we, we end up like trying to optimize just the tip of the iceberg. You cannot optimize everything because most of the time, and if I, I would go back, uh, most of the time here is spent on, on native code. So you're just optimizing the tip of the iceberg. So this makes you think, right? Like, uh, this is interesting. What can we do about this? So if you ask yourself, uh, what is the first thing that comes on, on your mind when I say JavaScript engine? I think most of you will say V8. So if you look at the mission statement of the V8 project, uh, it reads something like speed up real world performance for more than JavaScript and enable developers to build a faster future web. So the performance of V8 is great, but there are more engines out there. So if you look at the Kangax table, which is not an authority on JavaScript engines, uh, it just lists the compatibility of ES6 across many. There you can see engines like uh, Chakra Core, uh, SpiderMonkey, Safari, and there's a, late, a new one that was a added like last year called GraalJS. So what my experiment uh, uh, was all about is that, well, I should try other engines because if most of the CPU is spent on native part, probably I should look into engines that uh, handle this uh, um, JavaScript runtime in a different way. So I decided to look into GraalJS. So GraalJS um, is an extension of the Java Virtual Machine that supports more languages and execution models. The Graal project includes a new high-performance compiler, itself called Graal, because, as you know, the most difficult thing in computer science, in science is naming things, so you call it also Graal, because it's uh, interesting. And the objective of Graal is to improve the performance of the, the, the virtual machine uh, on any language, and another goal is to allow free-form mixing of any programming language in a single program, so allows you to do polyglot programming. So on the same program, you can use uh, uh, Java, Scala, Groovy, JavaScript, Ruby, Rust, Python, C, C++. And what's interesting about this is that uh, because it's a new project and it's all up to date, they offer a modern uh, uh, JavaScript runtime based on ES 2019, ES 2020, which isn't released yet, but they already implemented the, most of the features. And my, the ultimate goal is to have a very fast server, but I don't want to change my programming language. Language I want to stay on JavaScript. So if I look at the definition of GraalJS on their uh, website, uh, the, their goals are to execute JavaScript code with the best possible performance, have full support for the latest uh, ES uh, specification, and fast interoperability with all the languages, uh, on either on the, on the JVM or uh, other language uh, supported by Graal, like uh, Ruby, Python, and R. Uh, there, there are very, uh, lots of academic uh, research around this, because this project, al although it was open sourced last year, it's been running for more than eight years uh, uh, behind closed doors. Uh, it's just been open now, because now they feel that it's like in a, a real, stable, uh, uh, mature uh, project. So the, the, the people working and researching on this have already shown that the engine is uh, slightly better or on par with V8 for just pure language benchmarks. And you can read more about the paper there. So, and although you can even run like unmodified Node applications on it because it allows you to just replace V8 from, from Node, um, uh, I need to formulate an hypothesis. What if we create a project that I would call ECMAScript for X that first will replace V8 with GraalJS, second will replace LibUV with uh, Eclipse Vertex, will replace the V8 uh, just-in-time compiler with a Graal uh, compiler, will not you have Node bindings, it will just use uh, uh, TypeScript definitions because this can be discarded at runtime. So the code that you don't run is the best code because it's the fastest. You don't need to run it, of course. And it will offer you a basic common JS and ESM uh, uh, module loader as some basic uh, NPM compatibility and allows you to even debug and provide application with the tools you already know, like the Chrome DevTools. So 
if, I, if we were going to implement the, the, the previous uh, uh, example that I showed uh, with, with Node and Express using this new style, this is how the, the old Express code would be look like. So it, it, I guess it's not that hard to, to understand what's happening here. The important thing here to notice is that uh, uh, the, the, the library I chose, Vertex, by default uses all the available cores on your machine, so you don't need to use a cluster module to do forks. So this is all handled behind the scenes for you. And Vertex provides, provides us an uh, uh, optimized async IO API built on top of Netty. And Netty is an open source project that is used by big names like Google, Twitter, Netflix, just to name a few. So if you want to test this, First thing is that, well, you need to install a very simple uh, uh, application called uh, ES4X PM, like a short for Project Manager, because we cannot run Node directly. You need to run through, through ES4X. So if I had to show you, this is how it looks. I create a project. Uh, I can make it like uh, with a new module syntax, and I recorded this so uh, because I'm afraid that I wouldn't have enough time. So you just have a couple of dependencies. This is pure NPM, NPM stuff. I just use Vertex and Web because I want to uh, do a, a web application. So I create, and you can even do like the ES6 uh, modules exports. I can say, OK, my home page is a function that I will export that will just say hello, hello from Vertex plus ES4X. And of course, now I need to bootstrap a server, so I create the index, which is like my main application. And again, it's just to import some code from um, the, the Vertex uh, uh, library. I now import my route from uh, the, the module I just created, from routes. And now I just bootstrap, the, bootstrap my, my application, so I create the router. But it's kind of the same idea as the Express server. So I now create a router, a route on on home, and I just pass my my callback. And now I create the server. I specify who will handle my server request. Will be my my router. And now I start listening on port 8080, and I log some message. So. Up running. Yes. So now I can just in install. Well, I'm starting to mix npm and yarn. Well, doesn't really matter. So there are a couple of utilities like I can quickly get all my application running uh, on on VS Code. You see, it's already debugging. I can put a breakpoint, and if I put a breakpoint, and if I now make an uh, HTTP request, you see that the request is there stopped. And what's interesting here to see is that uh, due to the nature of GraalVM, you can mix and see on the debugger both your the code that comes from the Java side and the code uh, that you wrote. So everything is optimized. So the expectation is that once you write code in this way, um, is your user code plus your runtime plus your interop plus your engine plus your IO libraries plus the whole world that runs your application, in this case the, the Graal JDK, it will all be optimized by Graal, not just the script itself. You're not optimizing just the tip of the, uh, the, the iceberg, you're optimizing everything. So to test the experiment, Several months ago, I submitted to the Tech Empower an implementation of the benchmark using uh, this project. And after being reviewed, it got accepted. And this is how things are. So uh, this is like the, the, the CI builds. You see that now ES4X is, running, is uh, ranking on number five, which brings uh, JavaScript from number 86, if I'm not mistaken, to number five in a simple uh, database uh, uh, query test that goes on the Postgres and gets results and uh, rank number six when doing multiple queries. So you see the parallel uh, uh, loading and testing. So if I have to compare now this experiment with, with all the frameworks that were already on the, on, the, on the benchmark, this is how it compares. So when working with uh, JSON, well, we see that uh, uh, the results give you like uh, uh, two times better 
results than the previous uh, best result. When going on a Postgres database, doing one query, it's three and a half times better, but if you have to be fair, testing to the best previous one that was running on Postgres, it's six times better doing multiple queries, so it means like there's lots of concurrency going on. It's still two and a half times better than the previous one, and if we're doing like data updates where like concurrency is really the, the issue, you see it's like five times best, better than the previous one. So to put this in numbers, um, if you think about request response, uh, uh, you see that IA is better, of course. Uh, I'm not talking about very small improvements, tiny improvements. I'm talking about huge numbers. So the final tip is that uh, optimization is like a never-ending job. So for example, we could get better results if we r r not use an enterprise edition of Graal instead of the open source edition. Uh, and that, that gives you like 20% better performance. And because it's, it's optimization, it's a never-ending job. You need to rinse and repeat, in, and you just go like that. So um, the key points I want to give is that uh, there's nothing wrong with uh, JavaScript. JavaScript can be fast. And probably you don't need to switch to Go, Rust, whatever, uh, because uh, you're having uh, performance issues. You can still, if you dare to experiment, you can still uh, remain on, on JavaScript. So, uh, if you want uh, to uh, uh, learn more, you can either find me on Twitter, GitHub, uh, check the source code on, on, on GitHub, and uh, if there are any questions, you can catch me later. Thank you.